Okay. Thank you, Reb Gedalia. Was it Reb Shimon? Where? You had to leave. Okay. Okay. So I'll 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 talk about Reb Shimon behind his back, and uh, instead of thanking him, I'll uh, I'll just say. It's good to hear people like that who are real people. I remember one time, a few years ago, I, I told the Rebbe Shimon, I said, you know, I want, to t I want to tell you something. I don't like speakers. Like, I really don't like, I'm allergic to it. Because I do it professionally, I know the tricks, and so I, I, I know what they're I know the tricks of the trade, and it's, it's manipulative. I just can't stand it. I said, Reb Shimon, I like when you speak. He said, you know why? Because I'm not a speaker. And it's true. It's true. He's not, it's not performative. He's just being real. And if we could just take that and encapsulate that, and you know what that is? And this is what we need so much more of, just people being authentic. There's so much performance. There's such pressure to perform. And we just need more real people, authentic people. People who are speaking from the heart, speaking humbly. And, uh, you know, that's why I respond when Reb Shimon is speaking. And I just want to encourage each one of you that... You know, we all have a platform. We all have a, a sphere of influence. We all have a, we have people who listen to us. Wherever you are, whatever your, uh, your day job is, so to speak, there are people who you talk to. And um, I know there's pressure to make a presentation, especially in our community, and we're always thinking about Shiduchim and the family brand and all that stuff. But really what people need from you is your authentic self. So if, if you take anything from a Shabbos like this, maybe it could just be the lesson how important it is to just be real. And in that spirit, I'm going to try to be real. Um, I'm hoping, I'm kind of counting on the fact that this is a room of compassionate people. This is not your typical audience. And you're not going to make me perform for you. And I don't, I'm going to consciously remove from myself the pressure to give you the the performance that you want, and I'm just gonna I'm just gonna talk, okay? There's a lot to talk about. I'm just gonna jump in. Um, <sighs> the term we use is crisis chinuch. I think that's a misnomer. I think that's a misunderstanding. I think the crisis is what opens up our eyes to the truth. It's not crisis chinuch, it's chinuch. It's basic avas Yisrael. It's the way that we should be not just parenting all children, but it's the way we should look at children and adults and at each other and at our spouses. And it's just basic Yiddishkeit. Okay, what's it? What's it? It is... You know, I'm talking about the performance. I'm talking about the image. So deep down, behind all of that, there's the real me. And if you have any amount of spirituality, you, you should understand when I say, who's the real me, then it should make sense to you when I say, who's the real me? The real me is my nisham. And I just want you to see me as my neshama. That's it. And as believing Jews, we should be the first people who are good at that, who are good at seeing past the packaging and being able to perceive that there's something deeper in each other, that there's something that's eternal and infinite and good and godly that's there all the time, that never changes, 
that cannot be destroyed. But that should be their, that, sh that should be our default setting. I mean, like the Balatanya says, how, how are you Mekayim V'yahavtorecha Kamaycha? Which is a mitzvah. How do you do it? I mean, you could treat somebody nicely, but how do you actually have the Ava? How do you actually love your fellow Jew? So he says in Pereglamid Beis of Tanya that uh, you have to see him as a soul. And when you'll see him as a soul, then <laughs> why wouldn't you love a soul? When a child is born and they're lying there in the crib and the parents look at this baby, they have this, this feeling of pride. Look at this baby, this beautiful baby. They quell. And then something happens where that feeling of pride, it, it, it's, it's replaced with something else, with something different. Instead of having this feeling of this perfect baby, this perfect gift, all of a sudden, and, and, and when, when we look at the baby, there are no strings attached. Nobody says to their baby, why don't you grow up, learn how to talk, form a personality, we'll go out for coffee, we'll see if we can strike up a conversation, and then I'll decide if I like you. Nobody says that to their baby. You look at your baby and automatically there's a bond. But then after a while something happens where it's like that positive regard that you once had for this child is no longer unconditional. It becomes very conditional. It becomes behavior-based. It becomes based on performance. What you do, how I feel about you, has to do with what you do. Now, that, those, those were not the terms and conditions when, when the child was an infant. You had no problem having positive feelings about your child based on nothing that they've done. In fact, they can do nothing but just who they are. But then at some point, for some reason, what happens is, instead of having this good feeling and this connection based on who my child is, now it all becomes based on what my child does. Why does that happen? Why do we do that? I understand. I mean... I get it. Babies can't do anything, so you don't hold them to that standard. I get that. And as they get older, they are capable of doing things. I get that. But that doesn't... Ex follow me here. That explains why you don't have expectations of a baby's behavior, and therefore you don't have that, what we'll call, the nachas based on what they do. And with, with an older child or with an adult, you can actually be proud of their actions. I get that. But it doesn't explain what happened to the pride and the love that you had for the baby that was not based on what they do. You understand what I'm saying? Why did that go away? Why was that replaced with a new type of positive regard that's totally based on behavior? There's, there's two types of pride, and they can both be true at the same time. There's a concept, Hashem looks at us, at his children, and says, I appreciate when I told you to do something, you did what I told you, I have nachas, I feel good about that. Which implies, if you don't do it, then I'm not going to have that nachas. So that's conditional. And that's a real thing. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. But then there's something else, distinct and separate from that, which is a different type of pride, which is unconditional. Where Hashem says about the Jewish people, kulam tzadikim. they're all tzaddikim. Really, Hashem, did you look at, did you see? I mean, kulam tzaddikim. 
Nu, ko lūk cilvēkiem? Neicama tain maisa jodeli hispāja. The branch of my planting, the work of my hands in which to take pride. Lihis par means to take pride. Not just Hashem loves every Jew. Hashem is proud of every Jew. How could he be proud of every Jew? When they'll do something that, that, that makes him proud, then he'll be proud. No, that's the Nachas Ruch Lafan Isham Martiv Nasir which is a separate track. What about my Siyodilis Poer, that Hashem is proud of you, not because of what you did, but because of what he did in making you? So Hashem looks at the neshama and says, look at what I did. The neshama doesn't have to do anything to be worthy of that pride. Hashem is automatically proud just because of who you are. Why does that go away? Why are we in tune with it when a child is a baby? And why do we lose it and it gets replaced with the conditional behavioral-based pride as they grow up? You understand, I'm not telling you to pretend that there isn't such a thing as behaviors that are pleasing and behaviors that are displeasing. I think that's a big, hysterical, sometimes I think even willful misunderstanding. People want to pretend that we're saying there's no such thing as desirable behaviors and undesirable behaviors. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is there's a positive regard that Hashem has for every Jew that is not based on behavior. And that is the exact same positive regard that we're really supposed to have for all of each other, which is the mitzvah of Avas Yisro, a positive regard we're supposed to have for every neshama that's not based on behavior. That's not based on what they do. It's purely based on who they are, which is unchanging. And if, and really, really you're obligated to, mitzvah Avas Yisro, to have that feeling about every single Jew. And all we're saying is, at least could you do it for your kids? At least do it for your kids. Look at your child and see that no matter what they do, that is separate and distinct from who they are. They always were, they always will be. Ten years ago, if you would talk about unconditional love, you would sound crazy. Now it's somewhat normalized, I'm saying in our community. And a couple years ago, I started using the term unconditional pride. And I saw it triggered a lot of resistance, so I knew it was a good term to use. <laughs> Not just because I'm a contrarian, but because people have a lot of trouble with it. They're like, okay, unconditional love, I understand, but unconditional pride? Pride means proud of something. Right. It does mean proud of something. But why do you think the only thing there is to be proud of are behaviors? You have to look more deeply. You have to look at the essence. The essence means that which does not change. Behaviors change. Behaviors constantly change. They fluctuate. In fact, even in a good way, even in the most positive ideal scenario, ch uh, there's change in behaviors because yelch mechayel el choyel, you're doing better and better all the time. So behaviors are constantly in flux. They're moving. Essence, your identity, your true deepest identity, does not change. I mean, this is one of the core teachings of Teresa Baal Shem Tov, that a yid is a yid is a yid is a yid. That's it. You just are who you are. So why is this a radical concept? really shouldn't be. There's a, there's a Medrash Tona de Velio that asks a very interesting question. Okay, bear with me here. It says, I know that there are two things that came before the world. Right? Bereshis is base reishis. Bishvil base reishis. The world was created for the sake of two things that came before the world, right? What are the two things that came before the world? Hmm? Torah and Yisrael, okay. Torah and the Yidin, fine. So there are two things that came before the world. But I don't know, the Tana de Vilio says, which came before which. Like I know both of those came before the world, but of those two, which came before which? 
Now, let me explain something to you. When we say which came before, which came before, when you talk about something that's before the creation of the world, you're talking about something that's also before the creation of time. So before is not Kedima Sazman. It's not chronological Kedima. It's Kedima Samaila. It's qualitative precedence or prioritization. So when we say two things came before the world, we don't mean chronologically. We mean the world was created for the sake of two things. Meaning, it's not that the Abishta had a world and he looked at his world and he said, oh, you know what this world needs? Torah and Yisrael. And then he imported that into the world. No, Fakert. He had Torah and Yisrael for eternity. And then he said, you know what? I should create a world as a forum within which the greatness of Torah and Yisrael can be expressed. You following? Too philosophical? You're saying, just talk about the kids. Just skip the philosophy. Okay. Okay. But I, I think if you bear with me, it'll, it'll be worth your time and your effort. So when we say which came before which, we don't mean in time. We mean which one exists for the sake of which. Just like when we say the Torah and Yisrael became, came before the world, we mean that the world is here for the sake of Torah and Yisrael. So between Torah and Yisrael, is Torah there for the sake of Yisrael, or is Yisrael there for the sake of Torah? It's a very important question. In other words, I'll say it in Pashta Asius. Are you Jewish because you do mitzvahs, or do you do mitzvahs because you're Jewish? Follow? Meaning, do your behaviors give you your identity, or is it your identity that gives value to your behaviors? So the Tana de Vilio, which asks this question, answers it with a marshal. It says, I'll give you a marshal. There was a king. Okay, that's a common component of rabbinic parables. There was a king. And the king had children. And the king wanted to teach the children how to live. So he hired a malamid, he hired a tutor to teach the kids. Did the king have a teacher that he needed to give a job to and therefore he went out and had kids? Or did the king have kids who he wanted to teach the proper ways of living so he hired the Malamed? So the Tone de Vilio says, so too. Yisrael comes before Torah. It's not that the Abishter had a Torah and he said, who's going to do this Torah? Oh, Yisrael. No, it's he had his children. He had Yisrael, his children, and he said, you know what? I need to give them a way to bring out who they are, who they already are, who they will always be, but I need a means or a mechanism to bring that out for them to be able to reveal that. So he gave them Torah. But what this means is, the Jew's identity is not given to him or her based on their performance of mitzvahs. The performance of mitzvahs is the way in which a Jew has an opportunity to express their essential identity, which is there, even if they don't express it. I mean, where is it more clear that the children are the king's children? when they behave or when they don't behave. Of course they should behave, but I'm saying, when they behave, you might think the king's relationship with them is based on their behavior. But it's specifically when they don't behave that you see there's an underlying relationship, there's a connection that's much deeper, that's pre-existing, that the children are connected to the king already, and then the behavior is a secondary thing. So, this is what I want to ask you to do, not just with your children, but with yourself, starting with yourself, with your spouse, with friends. Can you stop identifying people and, and judging people and categorizing people based on behaviors 
And can you go a little bit deeper and try to start seeing people as neshamas? And that the neshama, being a chelik elakami mal, and like the Balatanya adds mamish, which mamish means not just emphasis, but it means in mamoshes, even in a physical body. Because you might think, well, you know, if I would meet my child's neshama in Gan Eden, I'm sure I'd be impressed. But in a guf gashmi, it's not so ayayay, right? So no, mamish, that even in the physical world, the neshama continues to be what it always is. So therefore... What should be your reaction when a neshama, when a chelak elikami mal enters the room? You light up. Not based on anything that they've done. If they've done something to be proud of, that's a bonus. That's very nice. That's extra. But I'm saying, a chelak elikami mal walks into the room. You light up. I have a parenting course, which is... Officially, it's not crisis chinuch, but like I told you, I don't even believe in that distinction. I believe this is just basic Yiddishkeit. So one of the things I teach in the parenting course is this unconditional pride. And um, I was explaining, unconditional pride means that you light up when your child enters the room just because your child is who he or she is, not based on anything that they've been doing not based on whether or not their behaviors please you or displease you. So there was this one father in one of the groups who really couldn't understand. He understood the concept, but he didn't understand the practical application. Like, okay, what, is, what does that mean? Because it was like too abstract for him, like the feeling. The, what is that? How, he was like, how are you, how do you, how are you Magdir, this you're telling me you have to light up when they enter the room. Well, like, that's too fluffy. Like, give me, give me a, put a handle on it so I can hold on to it. So the guy happened to actually be a rav. So I said to him, I'll put it in, in, in halachic terms. Make a bracha shechionu. I'm not seeing somebody for 30 days. There's a whole different, uh, different discussions about whether we do do it, we don't do it, whether it's the minig. But I said, setting aside all the complicated discussion, if you haven't seen your child in 30 days, is there a shaila whether or not you make a shechionu? What I'm telling you is that I want you to be able to have no shaila. If you haven't seen your child in 30 days, Thank you, God, for bringing me to this moment where I get to be in my child's presence. Not because of anything they're doing particularly to please me, but just to be here in my child's presence. This he understood. And really, like I'm saying, that's how we should be feeling about all of us. So it's really not even that uh, demanding to say, just start at home. And my hope is, and actually it's more than my hope, it's my suspicion that it's going to spread, that the healing that this community needs, as far as love and acceptance and allowing people to feel valued for who they are, for their godly soul, that's going to actually come about, and it is already starting to come about, um, from homes where crisis chinuch forced people to start to see their children's neshamas, and it emanated out from there, and Bar Hashem, it's viral in a good way that people are starting to see this in other contexts as well. And really, that's the track that we need to be on. Okay. Now I'm going to completely change the subject. Let's talk about um, a concept that maybe you feel has been beaten to death, but I think I have a new angle on it. Let's talk about trauma. I'm sure you've all heard about it and you're aware of how it affects 
human beings, particularly young people, and the burden that it places upon a person and why it would make things that you think of as being regular functioning, it would make it very, very difficult. Yeah, I mean, I don't have to, this crowd here, you're, I don't know, I mean, yes, no? I can skip this, you, you know this, right? Yes? Okay, okay. So, here's what I want to suggest to you. There are some of us for whom the embodiment itself is the trauma. I want to repeat that. The embodiment itself is the trauma. So you're saying, what happened? Who did this to you? Uh, sometimes there's an answer to that question. Sometimes the answer to that question is, we're dealing with very sensitive nishamas for whom physical embodiment itself is overwhelming. And that feeling of overwhelm is pervasive because it is not situation specific. It is ongoing because it is being in a physical body itself that is causing pain. I was a kid that when I was five years old, I used to fall on the ground weeping because the tag in my shirt was driving me crazy. And this is before the tagless T-shirts. This is back in the 70s, and my mother had to cut out all the tags for my shirts. And, you know, I was the kid who, sitting at the dinner table, and a sibling is breathing too loud, and I would become furious and start screaming. And you could call that chutzpah, you could call it bad midas, but if someone came up to you and, and, and took an air horn, you know, one of those things, bah! one of those things, imagine someone comes up to your ear, bah! I was driving here, we're in Stamford, Connecticut right now, I almost jumped out of my car. I was driving under the bridge and there was a train whistle. I almost, I, I, I literally, I just almost shot out of my body from the train whistle. So what I'm telling you is there are people for whom the embodiment itself, that means the requirement to deal with sensory stimuli is a pervasive, ongoing, traumatizing event that does not stop. Nowadays they call it HSP. They didn't have that term when I was a kid. By the way, can I tell you something? When I first heard the term HSP, I became furious. I said, either it's describing exactly my life experience, in which case I don't need to hear about it. I've lived it. Or it's not talking about my experience, in which case I'll feel misunderstood yet again, and I'll become even more upset. So I never actually read a book on it. I never, no, can't do it, can't do it. But what I'm trying to tell you is there are sensitive souls who are in existential pain. Do you know what I mean by existential pain? Existence itself is the source of pain. Now, many such people um, are quote unquote high functioning and engage in a behavior we call masking, which is presenting an image that is socially acceptable. And why do you do this? So that you don't experience social rejection. Because these highly sensitive souls often do experience a great degree of social rejection. And just because somebody is an introvert and is exhausted by being in a crowded room doesn't mean that they don't want human companionship or interaction. They just can't take it with such intensity. By the way, you know why I wasn't here for Shabbos? I can't deal with it. I can't deal with it. I can't deal with it. Thank you, you're clapping silently over there? You're acknowledging? 
Thank you. What, 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 what are you clapping for? The fact that I wasn't here for Shabbos? <laughs> that I acknowledged it? I started off and I said, we need more people who are just being real. Okay? I wasn't saying that as a speech. Yeah, go ahead. Clap for me. Sure. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. So I, I just can't take it. I can't be in a, in, 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 a, in a building with all these different people and every person has their different energy and it's like, it's just overwhelming. It's just too much stimulation. So like, what I'm telling you is, see, I can come up here and I can present myself in a certain way. Um, and I, I'm, I'm not doing it to deceive you. I'm pres I'm, to the contrary, I'm, I'm doing it in order that you can, you can hear my truth. Because if I would speak to you the way that I actually am comfortable speaking, you wouldn't hear me. You'd be distracted. So I have to put on a certain level of, certain level, certain degree. I'm a little bit more relaxed in this audience here. But for the benefit of being able to be heard, I'm behaving a certain way, my mannerisms, my, my vocal tone, my, my choice of words. Um, but what I'm telling you is that's not without a price. What I'm telling you is there are plenty of kids you think who are fine and they're not fine. They're exhausted because they go all day long to an environment where they are constantly suppressing their sensitivity and behaving in ways that will not incur, incur social rejection either by their peers or teachers or both. And they come home and they are exhausted and they come home and all they want to do is collapse or, 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 or behave in weird ways or make weird noises or spin around and it's freaking you out and making you uncomfortable. This kid was holding it together and then you say, why could you do it at school? Please don't wait until the, until the utter collapse of a child. We need to raise the bottom here. There are plenty of children who are in deep existential pain and because they didn't yet abandon Yiddishkeit, we're not acknowledging that there's an issue. Crisis Chinuch should wake us up to the underlying universal human condition that is present in all of us. So don't just think that when a kid falls apart, that's when all of a sudden we need to pay attention. We need sensitivity. We need compassion. We need empathy. Just understand that there's a lot more going on inside of a person than what you see outside of them. And especially if it's your child. That's your job. I'm sorry to say. Mothers and fathers, that's your job to know your child better than a stranger knows them. And if your child has needs to sort of let their guard down and be who they really are in ways that are socially unacceptable, and they need to do that in your presence, I hope you'll have the good sense and the compassion that your home will be the place where they can do that safely. Because if they, hold on, hold on. Because, and I'm going to take away the applause. Because if you don't, because if you don't, there are two options. There are two options. If they don't have that opportunity to, to trust you and to let their guard down with you and to be their weird self in front of you, there are only two other options. Either they have nowhere to go to be their true self and they are dying of loneliness, or they'll find people who they think accept them and allow them to be their authentic self. And you don't get to pick who those people are. And you better pray those people have noble intentions. Because wherever your child feels that he can be his true self or her true self, that's it. Those will become the values that your child will follow. Not your values. The values of wherever it is that they feel that they're being allowed to be authentic.
Okay. Now let me bring in another point. On this point of a child will take on the values of the group that they feel most safe in. Um, so I gave a talk for a girls' high school in Cleveland about chinuch, and it wasn't crisis chinuch, it was just regular chinuch, and I spoke about um, when, when you want your child to be able to receive your teachings, your values. So there's, a, there's, a, there's an expression, people don't care what you know until they know that you care. So I said, if your child doesn't feel emotionally safe with you, why do you think they would be interested in your values? Um, I said, I, I once heard a father say, when my child grows up and inevitably gets into trouble, which I know she will, she'll get into trouble at some point, I can't control that, but what I can control is I don't want her response to be, oh no, my dad's gonna kill me. I want her, her response to be, oh no, I better call my dad. So, so I said that. Somebody took a clip of that, and they put it on social media, and there was a comment from a, a family therapist, and I'm not sure who she is, but she had like 200,000 followers, so she must be, she must be good, right? Um, must be. And she commented on that clip, she said, this is the meaning of epistemic trust. So don't worry, I didn't know what it meant either. But, <laughs> and I know a lot of big words. Because, by the way, why do I know a lot of big words? Because I was the weird kid who would sit and read the dictionary. You have any dictionary readers? Any? Okay, so, all right. So funny who people think are the kids at risk. <laughs> it's counterintuitive, isn't it? Like the little dictionary reader, that's the kid you got to really, really support because it's a sensitive soul and the world is not always going to, yeah, the world is not always going to cater to that, to the contrary. Yeah. So at any rate, so yeah, I know a lot of big words, but I didn't know this word, epistemic trust. So I Googled it. And um, when I Googled it, then it made sense to me because actually in another context, I was aware of the concept called epistemology. Epistemology is a branch of philosophy concerned with the nature of truth. How do you know something to be true? Um, so epistemic trust means that you trust that what somebody's telling you is truthful. I mean, there's different types of trust. Like, I trust you that, I don't know, if I leave my door unlocked, you're not going to steal my stuff. That's like one level of trust, right? Um, but epistemic trust means I trust you that what you're telling me is true. And there are many different reasons you might have why you wouldn't trust somebody that what they're telling you is true. Maybe you think that they're a liar. Or maybe they're not a liar. Maybe they're just ignorant and they're passing on their ignorance to you. There are a lot of different reasons why you wouldn't rely on somebody to be a source of truth. Epistemic trust. So she writes in the comment, this is the meaning of epistemic trust. I responded, once I looked it up and I knew what it was, I said, I now understand what it says in the Kuzari about the first of the Ten Commandments. What did I understand? Kuzari discusses why the Aseris Hadibris, Maimon Har Sinai, the Abishta is revealing himself to Bnei Yisrael, and his first statement is, I'm the Lord, you got a Shetzisicha, me Eretz Mitzrayim, who took you out of Egypt. Why is that the first thing? And there are many different questions, different angles to come at that, but the Kuzari is primarily concerned with why is the Abishta giving a resume, and why is that the leading item on the resume? Like, you know who I am? I took you out of Egypt. And he explains... I'm going to tell you the way I understand it now, once the, the penny dropped for me and I had this clarity. 
basically what the Kuzari is saying is that even God Almighty is not exempt from this ironclad law of human nature. That before you tell me how to live, you need to establish a caring, safe, personal relationship with me. So even Hashem had to start, before you tell me your commandments, remind me that you were with me at my time of pain and you helped me and you took me from there and we have a history, we have a relationship. In the context of a relationship, I'm ready to hear the rest of your mitzvahs. But devoid of that context, who are you? Just waltzing into my life with a bunch of rules? How do I even know that what you're telling me is true? How do I even know that what you're telling me is good for me? Maybe it's bad. Maybe you're hurting me. So what it comes down to is the bonding, what we call the kashanafshi, it's not a bonus. It's not an addition to chinuch. It's the aside of chinuch. Because how can somebody be macabre? Even from Hashem himself, if it's not first established that there's a loving, safe relationship and a personal relationship. Once that's established, okay, tell me what else you want me to know. But when that's not established, why would I come to you for direction? And in fact, to the contrary, let's say you're not only the, not only are you not the source of my safety, but you're the source of further social rejection. So it's not enough I go to school and the kids don't understand me and the teachers don't understand me and everybody misinterprets my motives and I can never be my true self. I'm, an exa I'm exhausted from all the masking and trying to fit in. Then I come home and then I get the biggest judgment of all. Then the pressure to perform in a certain way and to, to give my parents that conditional nachas is so intense that the home is the, is the least, the least safe place. Well, you tell me, is that the place I'm going to learn how to live? Is that the place I'm going to receive direction? To the contrary, if I have an ounce of self-preservation in my body, which I do, because the Abish there in his infinite wisdom designed a person to survive. To survive. So if I'm in a place that is unsafe, it is basic human survival. I'm not going to stay in that place. I'm either physically leaving, or if I can't physically leaving, I'm emotionally checking out. So, let me say this in a simple way. Some kids were traumatized because something happened. Some kids are traumatized because they were born into this physical world. Some kids are double winners. They have both. <sighs> the world is a harsh enough place. I love parents who say, I don't want to coddle my kids because the world is a harsh place, so I don't want them to have false expectations. I want them to know how harsh the world is. I'll be their first bully. They don't say that, but that's what they do. Many parents are their children's first bully. Sad to say. And by the way, I would just want to say something. If you have the guts to admit that you have been your child's bully, and you want to do tshuva right now, then to me you are the greatest parent in the world. Bemokim shabali tshuva aimed him in the place where a true Penitent stands is the highest place. And if you can have the humility to say, I was the one who exacerbated my child's feeling of, un of being unsafe in this world, I'm going to now make it my life's mission to make them feel safe, then to me, you are the greatest parent, even greater than the parent who got it right from the beginning. I have like three minutes here. And there's this 
crazy compulsion I have to get into the deepest possible concept and see if I can cram it into three minutes. I'm going to do it. <laughs> Don't clap. You'll take up my time. I have three minutes here. Okay. So there's this word. A lot of people um, assume things about me. One of the things, common, common assumptions, misunderstandings, misconceptions, is that they think that I have some type of mental health training. I do not. I do not. Um, but sometimes, and I don't even read those books. I promise you. Like, I, But I hear words, and then I'm, I'm like, oh, those are good English words to describe concepts that I learned about in Xidus, and if I can use those English words as a marshal, then great. So I'm going to use one of these fancy English words, but please understand I have no training. I'm not using it in the clinical sense. I'm probably using it wrong. There's a, there's a term called neurodivergent. Okay. So neurodivergent, you know, like ADD and autism spectrum and a lot of different types of I heard people say that CPTSD is actually a form of being neurodivergent because the ongoing trauma rewires your brain, makes you neurodivergent. But at any rate, neurodivergent just means that your way of processing reality is different than what is neurotypical. Who decides what's neurodivergent and what's neurotypical? Basically, majority rule, okay? All right, so it's just a, a numbers thing. The origins of the Jewish people. We go back to our father, Avraham. Avraham was an interesting child. He had ideas that not only nobody taught him, but were like totally going against the grain of his family's values. And he had to figure it out all on his own. He didn't really have a mentor. Prophecy didn't happen until he was 75. So it was all just him figuring this stuff out. And he figured it out empirically. It wasn't like God spoke to him. He just started looking at the world. He's like, oh, is the sun God? Is the moon God? And he, basically, he came to this concept that there's only one God. And he did it just out of logical reasoning. So we're talking about this crazy genius. Like, figuring out the nature of reality completely on his own, and nobody understands him. Nobody understands him. And he's totally alone. Echod hoya Avraham. Avraham was literally the only guy who thought like he did. Nobody else thought like him. What's the old joke? The guy goes to the doctor, the doctor says, I have good news and bad news. What do you want to hear first? He says, tell me the good news. He said, the good news, they're going to name the disease after you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the point is, he's the only guy in the whole world, right? So you want to talk about being neurodivergent. You don't get more neurodivergent than that. We're going to name it after you. It's called Avromavino syndrome. You're the only one in the world who sees reality this way, and nobody else sees it this way. And um, long story short, I'll sum up millennia of history in a sentence. The Jewish people continue to be different. We continue to be set apart and we continue to be misunderstood by a neurotypical world that misunderstands our motives at every turn. And it can be very lonely. Now when Mashiach comes, the whole world is going to see the truth and going to be okay with the truth, and then world peace. It's going to be beautiful. But until that happens, at least among each other, zwischen uns, 
can it be a safe space, at least for the people who have this particular form of neurodivergent thinking called being Jewish? Jewishness is a form of neurodiversity. And in fact, I might even say that the entire concept of neurodiversity had to be given to the world at this time so we would finally have a muscle with which to adequately convey what is Jewishness. We're in a world that doesn't understand us. We're in a world that misinterprets our motives. You know what happens often, you have a family system where you have a little neurodivergent kid who's the truth teller because they don't know what's socially inappropriate, so they say uncomfortable truths, right? They don't know they're saying anything wrong. They're just, I'm just telling the truth, right? Um, if you have in that same family a narcissistic parent, then that truth-teller child will be scapegoated because the narcissistic parent thrives on the lie that they are perfect. And the neurodivergent child can't help himself or herself from saying the truth. Not maliciously. The neurodivergent kid is not trying to bust anybody or shame them. Narcissists, by the way, when narcissists say unconventional truths, it is to make you cringe. They do it just to watch you cringe. When, yeah, when, but this little neurodivergent kid who's saying the truth, he doesn't even know he made you cringe. He finds out a year later why his friend doesn't talk to him anymore. He doesn't know what he did. So what happens is these neurodivergent kids get scapegoated and they become the, the they become designated to carry the shame and the blame of the narcissistic parent who has to pretend to be perfect. I want you to understand there's something similar going on in the world today. That the Jewish people have historically been scapegoated. We are the truth tellers. We're the neurodivergent kid. And there are elements in society, in the world, who are like the narcissistic parent, who always has to be right, who cannot, cannot face the reality that maybe they're not the most perfectly virtuous one. And that is why they have an obsessive hatred for the truth teller. And then they employ their henchmen, their flying monkeys, and they get people to hate the neurodivergent kid, and to believe lies about him. I'm telling you this because I want you to understand that Jew hatred in the world is in macrocosm, meaning it's a larger example of the constant pressure that children who are different feel in our communities and in our families. Do you understand the parallel and the comparison? So at the very least, our homes have to be a haven for allowing children to be who they are. And what that means is, I'll say it very clearly, I see your neshama. I see that you have value, infinite value. You do not have to earn your worth here in this home. Your value comes with you inherently just because Hashem made you. And Hashem made you exactly as He made you. And Hashem doesn't make mistakes. And your quirks that cause you to be socially rejected are not liabilities in this family. Your quirks and what makes you unique and special is cherished in this family. And maybe if more families would do that, there would be a cultural revolution in our community, and our community would start to value people who are different. And then maybe we would have leaders who would speak openly about being different. And maybe a lot of the wounds that we're carrying as a community would start to heal. But it's going to, not going to start, I see it is starting by these families. The families who are forced by dint of crisis, to come to terms with this truth, this is where it's emanating out from. 
So please do not just hold on to this as something that you keep as a secret in your home. This is a model for healing for the entire community and ultimately for the entire world. It's lunchtime.